Have you ever sat with single parents trying to retain custody over their kids? Hard-working mothers and fathers actively trying to get off the unemployment benefit whilst craving for the opportunity and dignity to earn a living wage? Or have you heard the other side of the story of the young person who'd been expelled from school, disintegrated as a result of constant belittling and stereotyping? The teachers were right and the student was wrong. Yet another student misunderstood. So these young people and these parents are our friends. And it is their work and it is this relationship and trust that inspires our work. Your race, upbringing, nor the neighborhood that you grew up in should not determine how society reacts or relates to you. But unfortunately, it does. At Critical, we don't shy away from the fact that our neighbors inspire and shape our work. As migrants ourselves, we're particularly passionate about developing resilient responses to the challenges that our community has to overcome. We're a circular design lab co-creating ingenious products, spaces, and experiences. Our mission is to harness the power of technology in order to close the expertise gap. We do this by inviting parents and young men and women to work on projects alongside us. Like when Fonterra commissioned us to solve the challenge of reducing the plastic waste. We turn milk bottles into beautiful furniture and help students and teachers in our local school reimagine their classroom spaces in a playful way. Or when Auckland Council approached us to fit out an underutilized community facility, we discovered that the problem was disempowered locals. So we formed a local collective and using participatory design, we empowered mums and local residents to shape the space and future programming. The resultant Pukitapapa Creative Lab is a flexible space that addresses the nature of change, from media collectives to refugee collectives. Being co-designed and made by the community, our hope was to impart local resilience and collective ownership over a space that belongs to them in the first place. And when we joined forces with a single dad from our neighborhood to develop a digitally fabricated, eco-friendly casket, a mouthful, I know, but this is a case in point where harnessing the power of technology can close the expertise gap for previously unskilled workers, for whom a future riddled with robots threatens their basic livelihood. This is why we begin with the belief that everyone is a designer, and that by practicing radical inclusion, we can suspend our professional assumptions in favor of drawing out the expertise in the room. So over the last four years in New Zealand's most culturally diverse suburb, Pukitapapa, Mount Roskill, We've encountered talented young outliers whose strong sense of duty to Fano leave them having to get a real job instead of finishing school. We were young people once ourselves, believe it or not, <laughs> disillusioned by the self-made success culture. So seven years ago, we moved into this community in search of belonging ourselves. Being sons of first-generation immigrants who had to overcome poverty in search of a better future, it gave us the ability to understand the realities of struggle against our present privilege. We became part of an experimental community that sought to share everything with our neighbors except our wives. <laughs> we played basketball with teenagers, ran barbecues with Fano, and very quickly our neighbors became some of our closest friends, mentors, and teachers. They've created a home for us. And it's in between some of the most challenging stories and circumstances that we encountered a sense of determination and nous that we'd often seen celebrated in blogs and podcasts about Silicon Valley founders. The innovators, it seemed, were right under our noses, and it got us thinking and searching for ways to amplify and grow this phenomenon. And so we set out to create meaningful opportunities for people who'd so often been sidelined. We began to think of our neighborhood as a family, as a team, trying to win the game despite the rules being stacked up against them. So a powerful analogy that we've encountered is the difference between winning in basketball and winning in football. Now, this difference can be categorized as strong or weak link networks, and it is a core framework to our mission. The question that they ask is this, what matters more when you want to build a great team? Does it depend 
on how many superstars you have, or does it depend on the skill level of your worst players? So, for example, a football team is made up of 11 players, and quite often it's a chance goal that determines who wins or loses in a match. Sometimes a beautiful sequence of play develops over eight passes, but if the ninth one is not successful, your team's chance of scoring resets. If you're to build a football team, you're better off investing in your three or four seemingly worst players rather than a player like Lionel Messi. By investing in those three or four players, you increase the chance of that ninth pass being successful too, therefore the chance of scoring and winning the game. In this way, football could be seen as a weak link sport. Conversely, in basketball, you have a team of five players, but it is very much a sport that depends on having the best player on court. There's no real way the opposing team can get the ball out of your best player's hands. Think Michael Jordan. Arguably, LeBron James is the best player of our generation. Despite the rest of the roster, he has managed to make the NBA Finals seven years in a row. In basketball, you always put your money on the superstar. Basketball is a strong link sport. And this analogy is particularly helpful when we think about who we back to grow our economy or how our society is structured. The Western Industrial Revolution caught fire in England because they had a high number of tradesmen, craftsmen and engineers. In order to achieve what we believe New Zealand is capable of, we need to think of ourselves as a football team. It's been said that it takes a village to raise a child, but in recent times, we think the village has been entirely been forgotten. The answer to inequality is not altruism, nor is it the sole responsibility of charities, social enterprises, nor governments. We need to stop emulating Silicon Valley's basketball teams. Solutions like the Great Auckland can appear to be doing this, but they are at best half of the answer. We need innovative ecosystems that are decentralized and unbiased by demographics. And so our idea is that in order to make the most of the creative and cultural capital of our migrants, refugees, and grassroots communities who hold the determination and nous that our country needs, we need to harness the power of technology and accelerate the closure of the expertise gap. So these guys over here are the Roscoe South Makers, a collection of young fellows from our street who used to struggle in the traditional education system. We needed to scaffold their personal development, and this meant for us to enter into their world to understand their everyday context. We needed to empathize. We needed to allow these young fellows to transform us as much as we hoped to transform them. In the space of three months, the boys have become designers and digital fabricators. After spending a short time, the rate of their design output skyrocketed. They were out designing us. They developed names for their vases with the hope of telling a more accurate story about the neighborhood. Richard chose the centerpiece because he is proud of his Tongan heritage and he wanted everyone to embrace their ancestral roots. Eli chose the star and it symbolized for him hope and it is a symbol that embraces every individual. We learned that by building New Zealand's team and the story was not about the technology we deployed but the psychology that creates the attitude for thriving. Technology is a tool that can close the expertise gap, we know. But equally so, it is in the development of growth mindsets that enable these young men to think creatively about their future and the challenges that affect their everyday lives. With our partnership with Wesley Intermediate School, we set out to answer the question, what are the mindsets, skill sets and tool sets that students need to develop in order to see themselves as young people who can make a difference? In order for the partnership to work, we needed to move past models of non-participation towards models of citizen power. And so every workshop is designed to turn teachers and students into designers. Designers who determine and decide what powerful learning and making is. There's one girl in one of my workshop classes who creates game engines in the Scratch coding language just for fun. Just in case she needs them for future game ideas. She's exploring gravity engines and the core mechanics of platformers. And the question that keeps coming up for me is how do we know, honestly, how do we know where our next breakthrough is coming from? 
And the answer I keep coming back to me is that we don't. We learned that, learning, that building New Zealand's team in this instance looks like providing opportunity as early as possible so that students can experience technology and making in an authentic way. For teachers, it's looked like embracing messy teaching methods and learning to trust that their students are in fact inventors, designers and collaborators. It's about time that we rediscover expertise and skills development. It took six Māori and Pacific Island boys three months to go from idea and business concept to market without any prior education in that domain. It is our strong belief that by shifting our focus away from just finding the best people to build the best possible team, we will see New Zealand become the innovation force that we all want. Instead of only pouring money into the ideas coming out of our most well-educated elites, we need to support the ideas and people that we have sidelined as a society. Let's play our game with our team in our way. Balls in your court. Thank you.